Tonight we're talking about the second coming. Now there's a lot to talk about with the second coming, and here's where I'm going to focus. I'm going to do as as previously announced. We're going to follow the the agenda as it was uh, outlined there on the on on the announcement of this night's topic, and that is to focus on some of the signs, but more importantly, how we can prepare according to those signs, uh, prepare for the second coming. And uh, I'll explain a little bit more clearly what that means and how, how we're going to get to where we're going. But to, to get there and to kind of bridge the gap, I've noticed that, there, that the second coming is a pretty hot topic right now. And there's a lot of people uh, with a lot of videos out on YouTube and elsewhere that are addressing the, the, uh, the topic. And those videos get shared and people bring it to my attention and ask me questions about things they heard on, on those uh, recordings. And those recordings are really great. They're fantastic. Um, and they're just full of a, a bunch of information that's backed up by biblical prophecies and Latter-day prophecies. And, and those are all, they're all really great. Um, in addition to some of the online things and, and uh, what other people talk about, I think back to when we did go to church in Sunday school and in priesthood meetings and whatnot, when the topic would come up, the, the lesson topic would be the second coming, and we talk about what are the signs, and we'd rattle off and list on the on the chalkboard um, all the the signs that that we can watch for the wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and the earth in commotion and men's hearts will fail them and all those ones that are the the popular um, topics. And these are the topics that are continually being discussed today, which I think is a good thing. In fact, it's a great thing because the Savior commanded us to to watch and uh, and, and be and to notice these the signs and whatnot. Um, but tonight, I'm going to take a, a different approach to everything I just described, because in addition to all those what I call temporal signs, there's a lot of spiritual signs, and it's the spiritual signs that don't get talked about, and yet they're probably the most important, um, and maybe they're not talked about because they're much more difficult to identify uh, or to recognize when they're actually happening. See, when an earthquake happens, we know an earthquake happened. Um, when a whirlwind happens, we know when a whirlwind happens. And all these other things that are part of the temporal signs, they're easy to identify because the nightly news identifies them for us. But it's the spiritual signs, the subtle signs that are hinted at throughout the Book of Mormon and throughout the teachings of the Latter-day Prophets and Joseph Smith and by the Lord himself as recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants, those ones are a little bit more difficult to recognize as, oh, this just happened. This spiritual sign just happened. And oftentimes it's unlike an earthquake where it's not an instant uh, result. These spiritual signs come to fruition for people at different times and, and over a different span of time as well. So let's get into that and, and, um, and we'll, we'll see, see, uh, see some of the things that we identify according to those sources. But before we do, let's touch briefly on the temporal signs. Very briefly, and then we'll spend the rest of the time on the spiritual. So let me take you... Oh, one more thing I got to let you know before we, we really start rolling here. If you've been on these firesides before, you know I like to stare into the camera or this re the record the camera and uh, and just tell you the stories and just fire the stories off as fast as I can. Well, tonight um, I'm going to be reading a lot from the Book of Mormon and from uh, the testimonies of prophets and things that they've said. So usually we're looking eye to eye, but tonight you're just going to be looking at the top of my head. I I hope that you like the top of my head because that's about all you're going to see tonight. In fact, maybe you'd prefer it that way. Uh, but here is uh, a small recap, a brief recap of the temporal signs. President Ezra Taft Benson, in the 1987 General Conference, he gave a talk entitled The Savior's Visit to America. And in that General Conference talk, he said this, The record of the Nephite history, meaning the Book of Mormon, the record of the Nephite history just prior to the Savior's visit reveals many parallels to our own day as we anticipate the Savior's second coming. Now, as you read the Book of Mormon, you know what happened before the Savior appeared to the Nephites. you got to go back into Helaman. And it's not just the, the bad destruction stuff that happened in 3rd Nephi chapters 8, 9, and 10, but go way back into Helaman, almost to the beginning of Helaman, and you can start to see things that are happening leading up to the Savior's appearance 
there on the American continent. So I'll say again, the record of the Nephite history just prior to the Savior's visit reveals many parallels to our own day as we anticipate the Savior's second coming. So what are the things that were happening in the book of Helaman and up to 3rd Nephi chapter 11 that we could find in parallel with what's going on in our world today? Well, I went back through those several chapters of the Book of Mormon, and I, I jotted down what was happening in the Nephite civilization. And as they parallel to our own world, I'll let you connect those dots. I'm just going to give the information. But then you connect the dots and see if these things have come to fruition, or if they are, are in the middle of it, or if there's things that we're still waiting for. But this is what happened in Helaman, in the Book of Helaman, in the Book of Third Nephi, that President, Nel President Benson claims will be uh, what happens in our world just prior to the second coming. So here we go. You ready? In Helaman and 3rd Nephi, what are some of the things that we can look for at, that could be in parallel to our day? Well, out of the Book of Mormon, we see political divisions. Individuals seeking to, to, to destroy personal freedoms. We have an enemy that's not known or seen. Enemy forces gather. Political strife distracts the government from seeing the enemy. Political strife distracts the government from seeing the enemy. There's a lack of na national security or defense. The Nephite civilization had reached great heights. They were prosperous and industrious. The people rejected the Lord. Pride became commonplace. Dishon dishonesty and immorality were widespread. Secret combinations flourished. People began to be distinguished by ranks according to their riches and their chances for learning. Satan had great power into the stirring up of the people, into doing all manner of iniquity, into the puffing them up in pride, tempting them to seek for power and authority and riches and the vain things of the world. They did not sin ignorantly, for they knew the will of God concerning them. There were but few righteous among them. People as a whole rejected the Lord. They stoned the prophets and persecuted those who sought to follow Christ. And then, of course, after all of these things, that's when nature decided to have its way. And that's when the earthquakes and the tempests and the fires and the floods started to come. Now, I won't get political, and, and I know that there's people throughout the world watching this recording, so I won't just talk about where I'm living. But maybe you could see where you're living, and in your viewpoint, um, maybe some of these things have come to pass, are coming to pass, or you could see them just around the corner. Political strife, political upheaval, immorality, dishonesty, et cetera, et cetera, the whole list. I won't, I won't say the whole list again. But you heard the list, and perhaps you're seeing these temporal signs coming about. Now, what happens at the end of these temporal signs of the Nephite nation? The Savior comes. What does President Benson say at the end of all the temporal signs that we're seeing today? What happens? The Savior comes. So are they the signs of the times? Yes, they are. Let me read to you what happens when the Savior does come. Now, a lot of times we say that the set we we say the second coming as though it's one event. Well, it's not. It's at least two, and there's probably multiple things, multiple events that that when taken together comprise what we call the second coming. The first of these many events will take place at Adam on Diamond. Adam on Diamond is where the Savior will appear first, and that will initiate the beginning of the second coming. I'll read to you a quote from, Pre from Elder Bruce R. McConkie. We now come to the least known and the least understood thing connected with the second coming. It might well be termed the best kept secret set forth in the revealed word. It has something about which the world knows nothing. It is a doctrine that has scarcely dawned on most of the Latter-day Saints themselves. And yet it is set forth in Holy Writ and in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith with substantially the same clarity and as any of the doctrines of the kingdom, and that is Adam on Diamond. So if you'd like to know more about Adam on Diamond, you can click the link and watch that movie, that 50-minute uh, fireside I did on it. But we have Adam on Diamond occurring first, and then from there we start to have the other events that are more widely well-known, such as him descending in a cloud of glory and, and the whole world recognizing him, and uh, uh, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is is the Savior. Okay, so that's the physical physical signs, Tem the, the temporal signs, I call them. Now let's, let's shift gears for the rest of the time and focus on the spiritual signs that we've got to also be aware of. 
uh, the spiritual signs, though, we do, we do need to proceed with caution. Because they are of a spiritual nature, um, meaning that they are they're personal, they, it has to do with our spiritual growth or our lack of spiritual growth. We have to be very careful that when we talk about spiritual signs that we don't recognize the signs coming, coming to pass in others, unless it's a positive thing. And here's the example I would give you. Back in April 2015, President Nelson, he was then Elder Nelson, stood up and talked about how we need to make the Sabbath day a focus of our worship and keeping the Sabbath day holy. And the two key phrases in there is that we needed to make the Sabbath a delight. And in order to make the Sabbath a delight and truly worship Heavenly Father in a proper way on the Sabbath and to keep that day holy, we need to ask our question, or we need to ask the question, what sign am I giving to God? You remember these things, right? And in asking what sign am I giving to God, Elder Nelson then taught that, that if we could answer, but we're giving a good sign, we're giving a proper sign that, that what we are doing, our action that we're involved in, is giving a proper sign and worship to our Heavenly Father. Well, then that's an okay activity to do on the Sabbath. But if we say, no, you know, I don't like what Heavenly Father is seeing in me right now, well, then maybe that's not what you should be doing on the Sabbath. So my example is the Sabbath day because of just that. What might be right for you is not necessarily right for somebody else and vice versa. So when somebody says, well, I'm going to do this activity, and what sign am I giving to God? Well, that I love him and I want to spend this time with my family. So I think this is okay. Whereas a next door neighbor or a friend or a family member might look at that activity and say, there's no way I would do that on Sunday. And yet they're answering the same question. So when we talk about spiritual signs, we need to be very careful that we take, that we address ourselves individually in regards to these things and only point out the signs coming to pass in others if it's a, if it's a righteous uh, thing that we're saying. Okay, so with that, and, and likewise, I don't know who's on here. I'm, I'm looking at the stats, and there's a lot of people watching this video, um, but I don't know who's on the video, so I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers either. I'm just giving the information, and we'll all conclude and come to connect the dots and come to a conclusion as the Spirit individually teaches us, is, is what I hope. So let's do this. All right, now, are we feeling a bit overwhelmed in preparing for the second coming? Are we seeing these temporal signs and now some of the spiritual signs we're feeling like, boy, there's a lot to do and I'm kind of behind? Don't worry about it. Okay, you need to worry about it, but don't feel like you're in over your head and can't get things done because Heavenly Father has always prepared a way. He's always prepared a perfect plan for us to be taken care of, well taken care of. Let me give you an example of COVID-19. How did the Lord set us up perfectly to be prepared for a worldwide pandemic where everything got shut down, at least temporarily. In other places, it's still happening in some degree or another. Let's go back all the way to President Nelson's talk in April 2015, Sabbath Day of Adherence. So we practiced keeping the Sabbath day holy. Then once we got good at that, they introduced something else. Then in the spring of 2018, they started talking about ministering. And we talked about ministering. And all of our sacrament meeting talks and our Sunday school lessons and our priesthood and Relief Society lessons were all about ministering. And we keep going ministry, ministry, ministry. And maybe we got kind of tired about hearing about ministering, but we kept hearing about it so that we could practice and get good at it. And then in January 2019, they introduced Come Follow Me. And leading up to that, we had teacher counsel. So you learn how to be a teacher. Then you go and get the Come Follow Me manual. Now you've got to be a teacher to yourself, to your spouse, to your friends, to your ministering people, to your children, grandchildren, whoever it might be. So now we're doing Come Follow Me after having been trained how to be a teacher, teach in the Savior's way. And then in January 2020, the new youth program starts. And then not even three months later, March 2020, COVID hits and church is canceled. And church gets canceled on a Friday. And we don't go to church two days later on Sunday. But what happened? Nothing. It all went perfectly. Why? Because we had practiced how to keep the Sabbath day holy. We practiced how to take care of each other, look out for each other's temporal and physical and spiritual needs through ministering. We had practiced church at home, home-based, church-supported church. We had been trained how to teach. We then were teaching for over a year through, uh, out of the Come Follow Me program. And what about youth activities? What about summer camps and girls camps and EFYs and all these things? They all got shut down. Well, that's okay because the new youth initiative has nothing to do with that anyway. We had a couple of months to work on it and, and figure out how to do the new youth, youth program as a family. So you can see hindsight. Heavenly Father set everything up perfectly. So when COVID hit, church gets canceled. Two days later, this is our first Sunday out of church. And what happened? 
everything the way that it should happen. And our spiritual growth was edified. Everything went holier and uh, higher and holier just as prophesied that it would. So we can see Heavenly Father is preparing us. We can count on Him continuing to prepare us. But we've got to, we've got to look for this, these spiritual signs. Let me take you to DNC 65 verses 2 and 5. The keys of the kingdom of God are committed unto man on the earth, and from thence shall the gospel roll forth unto the ends of the earth, as the stone which is cut out of the mountain without hand shall roll forth until it has filled the whole earth. Call upon the Lord, that his kingdom may go forth upon the earth, that the inhabitants thereof may receive it, and be prepared for the days to come, in the which the Son of Man shall come down in heaven, clothed in the brightness of his glory, to meet the kingdom of God which is set upon the earth. Now did you catch that word? That the Savior will come down to meet the kingdom of God which is set upon the earth. Oftentimes, I've heard it, is it gets backwards. And we think that the Savior is coming and bringing heaven to earth. No. According to his words, Doctrine and Covenant 65, he is coming to the kingdom of God, which is already here on the earth. And that just means the restored church? No, it doesn't. Elder Christofferson teaches with clarity what these verses mean and how it is that the Lord does not bring the kingdom with him, but he comes to the kingdom that's waiting for him. Elder Christofferson, first, and crucial for the Lord's return is the presence on the earth of a people prepared to receive him at his coming. He has stated that those who remain upon the earth in that day, and then he's quoting from Doctrine and Covenants, from the least to the greatest shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord and shall see eye to eye and shall lift up their voice and with the voice together sing this new song saying, Lord hath brought again Zion, the Lord hath gathered all in one. The Lord, Lord hath brought down Zion from above. The Lord hath brought up Zion from beneath. And then Elder Christofferson's words, In ancient times, God took the righteous city of Zion to himself. Right? The city of Enoch. By contrast, in the last days, a new Zion will receive the Lord at his return. Now here's where our thinking has sometimes been backwards. We talk, I, I hear people talking about how, and myself included before, that, that the world is going to become so sinful. And the only way to overcome the sin is the Savior is going to come and do away with it. And we talk about that as though the Lord is waiting for the world to get so sinful, so wicked, that he'll come and put an end to it. Well, an end will come to it because of his coming, but the Lord's not waiting for the world to become more sinful. If, if the Lord is waiting, the Lord is waiting upon a people to become righteous enough in order to receive him at his coming. And I think, and this is, I say I think, I th because it's my opinion, I think this is a tool of the adversary. Where the adversary can trick us sometimes to saying, hey, boy, this is a really crummy, evil world. There's a lot of evil out there. And, but that's okay, he'll make us think. That's okay because it's supposed to be evil. It's a sign of the time. But it's not, not true at all. It is getting evil, it's true. But it's not a sign, and it's a sign of the time. But it's not what we are, it's almost as if the adversary wants us to hope that things get more sinful because then the Lord will come sooner which the scriptures contradict that theory completely. The Savior, if he's waiting at all, he's waiting for a people that are righteous enough to accept him and to receive him. So let's, when we're talking about spiritual signs and how to prepare for the second coming, let's, let's think higher, holier. Let's not think the way the adversary would want us to think and justify the sin because it's the last days, it's got to be sinful, but instead to shun the sin and increase our righteousness in preparation for the second coming. It's as if like this. It's as if the world's standard is here. And our standard is here. And there's this gap. And as the what the Savior needs in order for him to return is for us to increase our spirituality. And what's happening as the world decreases their level of righteousness, we sometimes tend want to just keep that 
gap the same. So we kind of go with them. When in reality, what Dr. Covenant 65 is saying is despite what the world is doing up and down, we need to just be moving on the way up. That's one of our spiritual signs that we need to be watching for is how are we as members of the church doing with our righteousness? Are we coming closer to Christ or are we slipping with the rest of the world? Um, it's going to be hard to connect all these. I'm just going to jump one to one. So there's one thing to think about. Here's another spiritual sign to think about. That's the Constitution prophecy. And a lot of people might think, well, that's a temporal. You know, that's something that, 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 um, that we can see happening, the Constitution crumbling. I would argue, I won't, won't argue with you, but I would suggest that it's a spiritual sign, and this is why. So the constitutional prophecy, the Constitution of the United States, is this. Joseph Smith said, Even this nation, meaning the United States of America, will be on the verge of crumbling to pieces and tumbling to the ground. And when the Constitution is on the brink of ruin, this people, meaning the members of the church, will be the staff upon which the nation shall lean, and they shall bear the Constitution away from the very verge of destruction. Now to reiterate it and put it in other words, Eliza R. Snow recorded this, I heard the prophet, meaning Joseph Smith, say, quote, the time will come when the government of the United States will be so nearly overthrown through its corruption that the Constitution will hang, as it were, by a single hair, and the Latter-day Saints will step forward to rescue and save it. Now here's something that Elder President Benson said in regards to that prophecy, and he clarifies it. Sometimes we get we we look at that prophecy and think, well, we're going to have a member of the church be president of the United States, or we're going to have a bunch of senators that are going to go in and, and do something, which is not the case at all, according to President Benson. He says this, I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith, but it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by the citizens of this nation who love and cherish freedom it will be saved by enlightened members of this church, men and women who subscribe to and abide by the principles of the Constitution. He says the principles. What are the principles of the Constitution? Yes, how is this government going to form and function? What are the rules and regulations for the three equal uh, but separate um, bodies of government? Yep, that's right. Set it aside. What are the principles? the rights, the inalienable God-given rights to the American citizens that, that we cherish. They're found in the Bill of Rights, right? And, and, other pla and other places throughout the Constitution. But here in the Bill of Rights, what are some of the personal rights, the principles of the Constitution that could be or are being threatened today? Let me remind you of the First, Am uh, for the, of the, bill, the, the, the um, First Amendment, excuse me, First Amendment, what's, what are the principles that are contained there that might be at risk? Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom to assemble peacefully. Now, without me telling you my opinion, do you see any of those four rights being threatened today? Is the Constitution hanging by a thread in essence that so the government may or may not be teetering, but are the rights, the, the purpose of the Constitution, are those being threatened today, particularly those found in the First Amendment? Let's take a couple of ideas. Religion. Um, remember what happened with COVID. Okay, We're not going to our church buildings right now. Let me take you to the Book of Mormon. In the Book of Mormon, and now when Alma heard this, he turned himself about his face immediately towards them, and he beheld with great joy, for he beheld that their afflictions, now speaking to a group, that they had been humbled and that they were prepared to hear the word. Why were they prepared and humbled and ready to hear the word? Because this group of people had just been kicked out of their synagogues. They can't go to church. Okay, A group of people who cannot go to church. In verse 7, therefore, meaning Alma, he did say no more to the other multitude, but he stretched forth his hand and cried unto those who he beheld, who were truly penitent, and said unto them, these are the people who can't go to church. I behold that you are lowly in heart, and if so, blessed are ye. Behold, thy brother hath said, what shall we do? 
for we are cast out of our synagogues that we cannot worship our God. Behold, I say unto you, do, do you suppose that you cannot worship God, save it be in your synagogues only? And moreover, I would ask, do you suppose that you not, must not worship God only once a week? Now many, say, myself included, many say that they are now closer to the Savior and have the Spirit more abundantly in their life now than they did previous to COVID. And why would that be? Why could people make that assumption or declaration? The very reason that Alma said, you can't go to your church? Well, that's okay because that humbles you, makes you teachable, and you don't go to church once a week anyway. As if he's speaking to the Latter-day Saints. Remember, come follow me is not a Sunday thing. It's an all-week thing. Remember keeping the Sabbath day holy. Remember everything that I told you leading up to COVID? Keeping the Sabbath day holy. Ministering. That's a every day, seven day a week deal. Come follow me. That happens not just on Sunday. The new youth program. We don't go to church to participate in the new youth program. And so when we, like the people that I was talking to, can no longer go to church, what happens? We have those same humbling experiences and the same wonderful, glorious results that these good people in the Book of Mormon had. So are freedoms being taken away? Well, I don't want to get political, and everybody has their varying opinions, so let, let you connect the dots yourself. But in some way, in some shape, is religion being the right to worship being taken away? There's some states in America where you can get in a lot of trouble if you get together with other people. Let me, instead of giving my opinion, let me give you the words of Elder Bednar on this very topic. Elder Bednar said that the pandemic has alerted us to the limitations in the food supply chain, our dependence on other nations for essential medical supplies, pharmaceuticals, and other products, constraints in inventory and delivery systems for manufacturing plants and retail businesses, deficiencies in our national and local health care systems, the importance of defending the borders between personal liberty, constitutional rights, and governmental authority and attacks on the freedoms of religion, speech, and assembly. Elder Bednar says in June 2020, he says that, that the, the results of COVID and the reaction, whether it's good or bad or somewhere in between, whatever your opinion is, I'm not here to tell you what the opinion is, but somewhere there was a government reach, too far, too much, not enough, whatever you might think, he says the government authority had the attacks on the freedoms of religion, speech, and assembly. And those are three of the four constitutional rights that I listed. What's the one that's missing? Press. When they say freedom of the press, I like to think freedom of the truthful press. And when the press comes out and you can't, you watch one channel and they say one thing, you go to the other channel and they say the opposite thing, is that freedom of the press? Sure, they might have the freedom to broadcast, but how far from the truth is the press today. Again, it's not a political statement because you know, you're right, left, or center. It's different. And so when I say Elder Bednar's taken all three and said we've, we're under attack, and I say the freedom of the press, I'd add to it because of the lack of truth. Then Elder Bednar continues, the buzzer on the COVID-19 alarm clock just continues to ring and ring and ring. Gathering, meaning religious gathering, in short, is at the core of faith and religion. Indeed, if the faithful are not gathering, sooner or later they will be scattering. And because gathering lies at the very heart of religion, the right to gather lies at the very heart of religious freedom. I believe it is vital to us to recognize that the sweeping governmental restrictions that were placed on religious gatherings at the outs outset of the COVID-19 crisis truly were extraordinary. No other event in our lifetime, and perhaps no other event since the founding of this nation, has caused quite this kind of widespread disruption of religious gathering and worship. In North America, Elder Bednar points out, jurisdictions deemed services related to alcohol, animals, and marijuana as essential, while the services of religious organizations were classified as non-essential even when those activities could be safely conducted. While believers and their religious organizations must be good citizens in a time of crisis, never again can we allow government officials to treat the exercise of religion as simply non-essential. 
Never again must the fundamental right to worship God be trivialized below the ability to buy gasoline. So President Benson says the Constitution, or excuse me, Joseph Smith says the Constitution, the principles of the Constitution are going to hang by a thread. We almost lose them. And President Benson comes in 150 some odd years later and says, yes, it will be a thread, but it won't be lost. Be, the principles won't be lost because of the, mem the righteousness of the members of the church. So how are the principles of, of uh, religion, speech, peaceful assembly, and the press, how are they being saved by the Latter-day Saints? And, and President Benson is very clear. Remember, he says it's not going to be saved in Washington. It's going to be saved in the homes of the Latter-day Saints. How are we preserving them? Through the goodness of the Lord who prepared us for COVID by giving us Sabbath day training, come follow me training, Sabbath day observance training, the youth, youth, pro, youth program say, uh, uh, training. And so these principles of religion and speech are now being saved in the Latter-day Saints' homes as we faithfully follow a prophet by observing the Sabbath day, exercising our freedom of, of religion, right? Even though we're not like the people of Alma, even though we're not going to our buildings, we're able to exercise the freedom of religion by, by having the ordinance of the sacrament in our homes or to have it administered for us in our homes, uh, to, to teach the gospel, to learn the gospel, and to grow in unity with other members of the church despite our physical separations because of the power of ministering. And now I can echo what I've heard so many people say, we feel closer to the Savior and greater amount of spirit in our life now than we did before COVID happened. So is the constitutional principles being saved by the Latter-day Saints? Yes, they are. And now I'll read Doctrine and Covenants 84. And now we're shifting gears away from the Constitution. We're going to go to another spiritual sign. Doctrine and Covenants 84. And your minds and times have been darkened because of unbelief. And because you have treated lightly the things you have received. What things did we receive that the Lord is saying we've treated lightly? Which vanity and unbelief have brought the whole church under condemnation. And this condemnation resteth upon the children of Zion even all. And they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant. Even the Book of Mormon, that's what we forgot. The Book of Mormon and the former commandments which I have given them. Not only to say, but to do according to that which I have written. President Benson again. He talks about these verses, 54 through 57 in section 84. He says that condemnation has not been lifted from the church. Now, he's speaking back in the late 80s. Hopefully, it's better now. But he says back in the late 80s, he says this condemnation that we, we as a church are under for having taken the Book of Mormon lightly, we're still under that condemnation. And so here we have President Benson saying, in order to get out of the con the, the logical conclusion here of what President Benson is saying is in order to get out of the condemnation, we have to not take the Book of Mormon lightly. And so now I'm going to shift and read to you some verses out of the Book of Mormon that are spiritual signs of the second coming. So let's not take it lightly. The, the, um, the, the Lord is so serious about us reading the Book of Mormon that until we do so, or at least do better, we're under condemnation for it. So let's go here to 2 Nephi 28. And let me read you a spiritual sign. The Book of Mormon is full of spiritual signs leading up to the second coming. 2 Nephi 28, verse 7. 7 and 8. Okay, here's a warning. And if you read in the, in the chapter heading, it talks about, it identifies that this is the last days. Remember, the Nephites and the Lamanites didn't have the Book of Mormon. It's for us, written for us, right? So he's talking about what it's going to be like in the last days. And here's the spiritual sign, a spiritual warning to the Latter-day Saints. Verse 7, Yea, and there shall be many which shall, which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and it shall be well with us. And there shall also be many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry, nevertheless fear God. He will justify in committing a little sin, yea, a little lie, take advantage of one who, because of his words, take a pit for thy neighbor, there's no harm in this, and do all these things for tomorrow we die. And if it so be that we are guilty, God will beat us with a few stripes, and at last we should be saved in the kingdom of God. I'll go back and reiterate what I said before. Here's the warning. 
members of the church, and remember we're not pointing fingers, but members of the church are being warned against justifying sin. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. So let's look at the world. Yeah, the world's getting sinful, but you know what? It's okay, because it's supposed to happen. Sometimes we rationalize. Sometimes the adversary prompts us to rationalize that way. So what was unacceptable on TV is now, it's okay. Eat, drink, and be merry. We'll just be fine. You know, or, hey, this is a really good movie, except for that one part, but, you know, just close your eyes and ears or even fast forward it. It'll be okay. Eat, drink, and be merry. It'll be okay. It'll, be, it'll work out just fine. And what's Nephi saying? Latter-day Saints, you got to wake up. The COVID-19 alarm is ringing and ringing and ringing, as Elder Bednar says. And we've got to make sure that we're not falling into the trap that Nephi is prophesying and saying, hey, here's a spiritual sign that good members of the church have the potential of slipping in and justifying sin. Lie a little, cheat a little, it's okay, we'll be all right. It's just the way the world is. It's the way we do business. It's, what, it's the way entertainment's done nowadays. It wasn't good before, but it's all right now. Here's another spiritual sign and warning, again from Nephi. He kind of caught, he, he saw us in vision and kind of got going on us. So uh, 2 Nephi 28, verses 20 and 21. For behold, at that day shall he rage in the hearts of the children of men, meaning the adversary. So let me start again. For behold, in that day, meaning the last days, shall he rage in the hearts of the children of men and stir them up to anger against that which is good. And others, this is the danger, this is the warning, and others he will pacify and lull them away into carnal security that they will say, all is well in Zion, yea, Zion prospereth, all is well, and thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them carefully down to hell. What do we get comfortable with? Well, let's go back to what the Lord's done the last five years. Are we comfortable, too comfortable with how we keep the Sabbath day holy? How about the, uh, the way that we're participating in Come Follow Me, home-centered, church-supported type of worship? How are we supporting the youth and how are they participating in the new youth program? What about ministering? Oh, I really should go visit that person, but I'm not going to today. Are we getting uh, comfortable and at ease to where we say, you know what? All is well in Zion. We're okay. I feel the Spirit most of the time. And we do come follow me, kind of. And we do it good enough. Is it, and we do it sufficiently. All is well in Zion. Yea, Zion prospereth. All is well. And the, and the devil lulls them away into carnal security. So here's... Here's a warning. Now, it's followed up by President Nelson. Through the years, keep these two verses in mind that I just read to you about all is well in Zion and having that lazy attitude about, we're okay, we can, we can relax on our spiritual protection here because all is well in Zion. President Nelson says, Through the years, great and marvelous things have been heard from dedicated pulpits across the earth. Yet most people do not embrace these truths either because they do not know where to look for them or because they are listening to those who do not have the whole truth or because they have rejected the truth in favor of worldly pursuits. And then in a different talk, President Nelson says, Brethren, we, it was in the priesthood conference session, Brethren, we need to repent. We need to get up off the couch, put down the remote, and wake up from our spiritual slumber. Isn't he reiterating Nephi's prophecy. Okay, let's go to a different one. Helaman 16. We go to Helaman 16, and it's verse 22. Now we're back in Helaman. Remember President Nelson or President Benson said that the everything that's going on in Helaman and into third Nephi, it parallels uh, what is going to happen in our life before the Savior comes. So 16:22. So see if this prophecy is coming true. And of course, you connect the dots in your own life and in your own way. But let's see if, if you can see this happening in the world today. And this is four verses away from the start of 3 Nephi. So we're at the, right there before the Savior comes. We could say this is one of the last signs to be fulfilled before the Savior comes in the Book of Mormon. Verse 22. 
and many more things did the people imagine in their hearts, which were foolish and vain. Now let me back up. Imagine. What does imagine mean? It means not true, right? So you could read, and many more things did the people focus on that weren't true in their hearts, which were foolish and vain. Now let me read it the way that the prophet wrote it. And many more things did the people imagine up in their hearts, which were foolish and vain, and they were much disturbed. Now, are you turning on the evening news and getting bothered? Are you getting disturbed? Are you going to Facebook and you're seeing posts that make you a little uncomfortable um, because of what's going on? Do you see the world around you and not like it as well as you want to? For se- now i got to start over again because I keep interrupting myself. And many more things did the people imagine up in their hearts which were foolish and vain and they were much disturbed for Satan did stir them up to do iniquity continually. Yea, he did go about spreading rumors and contentions upon all the face of the land that he might harden the hearts of the people against that which was good and against that which should come. Now we hear about wars and rumors of wars. Even though they're rumors of wars, they're more easily identified than just flat out rumors. Satan is going about spreading rumors and contentions upon all the face of the land. Why? So he can harden people's hearts and get them to turn against that which is good. Now look around the world and see if that is coming to pass. And here's what President Nelson said, a different quote. Not in connection, but I connected it to this verse. President Nelson in 2016, he, he commands us, plead with the Lord for the gift of discernment. Then live and work to be worthy to receive that gift so that when confusing events arise in the world, you will know exactly what is true and what is not. He didn't reference Helaman 1622. I put the two of them together. But if you go back to the Book of Mormon, Satan did stir them up to do iniquity continually, spreading rumors and contentions, hardening their hearts, imagining things up. They were foolish, much disturbance, etc., etc. And President Nelson says, plead with the Lord for the gift of discernment, then work to be worthy to receive that gift so that when the confusing events arise in the world, as prophesied in Helaman, you will know exactly what is true and what is not. So if we're talking about signs of the second coming, spiritual signs, we see Satan going out there, causing disturbances, hardening hearts, and a lot of confusion, a lot of rumors. What are rumors? Things that aren't based on truth, right? And that's the word that was used in the book of Helaman, rumors. And so everything is not known. What is true and what is not true? What does President Nelson tell us to do? Pray for the power of discernment. And you'll get that gift. And you can be able to look at a situation and say, I don't think so. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't feel good. It's not right. Get rid of it. Oh, that? Yeah, that makes sense. I like that. I think that's true. That's right. I'm going to go with that. That's what the power of discernment is. You're able to sift through all the everything out there and put the garbage to one side and the goodness to the other side. And as we see this happening and as we're told to do this, that's a sign of the second coming. Okay, let me take you to another one. Okay, this one, now you've heard the quote about the very elect being deceived. Have you ever thought about how the elect get deceived? Are you seeing how the elect could be deceived based on these things that I've just read? Eat, drink, and be merry. Um, uh, all is well in Zion. The imagining things up in our hearts and, and uh, which are foolish and vain. It's very easy to be deceived when we can't see through with the power of discernment what is true and what is error. And that's how the elect get deceived. Sometimes we fall back on, well, the elect will be deceived because they won't understand doctrine. Well, no, that's, that's not in the scripture that I'm about to read to you. It's being deceived because we can't identify, because the, the line between truth and error becomes blurred by the adversary, and we've got to clean th- clear things up in order to not be deceived. So Joseph Smith, Matthew, chapter 1, verse 37. This is chap- Matthew 1, 37, translated by Joseph Smith. It's found in the Pearl of Great Price. And whoso tre- treasureth up my word shall not be deceived. Well, that's pretty cool. 
So the elect will be deceived, eat, drink, and be merry. The vain things of the world. Satan's going to stir it up. It's all going to be disasters. Lots of rumors. But then in, in less than a sentence, the Savior says, And whoso tre treasureth up my words shall not be deceived. In other, words, in other words, these last three verses that I took out of the Book of Mormon can all be pushed to the side, and you don't have to worry about it as long as you do what? Treasureth up, treasureth up my word. For the Son of Man shall come and shall send his angels before him with the great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together the remainder of his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. This is the second coming. And who's going to be there? Who will be the elect? Who will be okay? The people who treasureth up his word. What is his word? The word of the iron rod is the word of God. You remember the song. So we go back again to the Book of Mormon. Yeah, First and second Nephi. Is just a big, long prophecy about what the Latter-day Saints need to do in preparation for the second coming. So, what's, the word, what's the, the word? The iron rod, the scriptures, right? So, let's go to 1 Nephi, chapter 13. This is where it gets really interesting. Okay, 1 Nephi 13, what's going on? We've got <clears throat> Nephi is seeing a vision. And we love this vision because we talk about all the cool historical events that have already taken place that Nephi sees. He sees Christopher Columbus. He sees the colonization of America. He sees the Revolutionary War. This is cool. Nephi saw all that, and that's where our focus goes. But let's dig a little bit deeper in the same vision, and let's tie it into everything we've been talking about. Okay, verse 29. Oh, excuse me. Revolutionary War. Um, and then what happens? And then verses 12 through about 26 in chapter 13, the angel is telling um, Nephi that the Bible is going to come, and um, but it's, it's going to be confusing to your descendants and the people there in the promised land because uh, the great and abominable church is going to withhold some of the pure and precious truths. Okay, you remember this, okay? So the Bible's coming out, but it's, it's not enough to lead everybody towards everything that a loving Heavenly Father would like to give them because it's missing some key components. Verse 29, or key components meaning key doctrines. Uh, verse 29, And after these plain and precious things were taken away out of the Bible, and it goeth forth, meaning the Bible going forth without the plain and precious things, unto all nations of the Gentiles, and after it goeth forth unto all the nations of the Gentiles, yea, even across the many waters, which thou hast seen with the Gentiles, which have gone forth out of captivity, thou seest because of the many plain and precious things which have been taken out of the book, which were plain unto the understanding of the children of men, according to the plainness which is in the Lamb of God, because of these things which are taken away out of the gospel of the Lamb, an exceedingly great many do stumble, yea, insomuch that Satan hath great power over them. Now, sometimes... To really understand a scripture, you got to read it, but then you got to read it backwards. Okay, we got to this point, but how did we get to this point? The point being, many do stumble, yea, insomuch that Satan hath great power over them. I want to avoid that. How do I not stumble, and how do I make sure that Satan has no power over me? Well, go back up through the verse and find out why. Because many of the plain and precious things are taken out of the Bible. Well, darn it. I've got a Bible. And it doesn't contain everything, and so I potentially have the danger of stumbling, and Satan will have great power over me. Ah, but the wonderful blessing of Heavenly Father comes later. In verse 30, Nevertheless, thou beholdest that the Gentiles who have gone forth out of captivity and have been lifted up by the power of God above all nations, etc., etc. So here comes the power of God. And how's it going to come? Verse 34, and it came to pass that the angel of the Lord spake unto me, saying, Behold, the Lamb of God, after I have visited the remnant of the house of Israel, and this remnant of whom I speak is the seed of thy father, wherefore, after I have visited them in judgment, and smitten them by the hand of the Gentiles, and after the Gentiles do stumble exceedingly, remember back in verse 29, they're going to stumble because many plain and precious things are missing. So after I visit them, after they stumble because of the most plain and precious parts of the gospel of the Lamb, which have been taken back by that abominable church, which is the mother of harlots, saith the Lamb, I will be merciful unto the Gentiles in that day, insomuch that I will bring forth 
unto them in mine own power much of my gospel, which shall be plain and precious. So we've got problems because we've got a Bible that's missing some plain and precious things. And the Lord says, I'm going to reveal myself to the descendants of Lehi. They're going to record everything I say to them. And then I, through my power, I'm going to give all those words to the Latter-day Saints. In, uh, and he says it again, which shall be plain and precious, saith the Lamb. For, verse 35, for behold, saith the Lamb, I will manifest myself unto thy seed, and they shall write many things which I shall minister unto them, which shall be plain and precious, and after thy seed shall be destroyed and dwindle in unbelief, and also the seed of thy brother. And behold, these things that are being written are going to be hid up and come forth unto the Gentiles by the gift and power of the Lamb. And in verse 36, here's the home run. And in them shall be written my gospel, saith the Lamb, and my rock, and my salvation. So here we go. And let's, uh, oh no, that's the last verse I wanted to do. So it undoes all the problems that were outlined in 29. In 29, they're going to stumble. Satan's going to have power over them. And wasn't that the warning towards the Latter-day Saints in those three verses that I gave? Eat, drink, and be merry. Be at ease in Zion. And then um, you're going to imagine things up. There's going to be rumors and Satan's going to be in control. So what does the Lord says? He says, I'll be merciful in the last days and I'll bring forth my word after Nephi. Your descendants write it. They're going to hide it up. I'll bring it forth by the gift and power of God. And it will be to the undoing of all these problems because I'm going to reveal the plain and precious things. And so it counters everything that was in verse 29. Now, of course, you know what this is. It's the Book of Mormon, uh, just as we're talking about. And as uh, Joseph Smith translated correctly in Matthew 137, Whosoever treasureth up my word shall not be deceived. So it's all about the Book of Mormon here. Now let's go to verse 39 in, in chapter 13. And after it had come forth unto them, meaning the Book of Mormon, as soon as the Latter-day Saints have the Book of Mormon, um, uh, Nephi says, I beheld other books which came forth by the power of the Lamb from the Gentiles unto them, unto the convincing of the Gentiles and the remnant of the seed of my brethren and also the Jews who were scattered upon all the face of the earth, that the records of the prophets and of the twelve apostles of the Lamb are true. And the angel spake unto me, saying, These last records which thou hast seen among the Gentiles shall establish the first, the truth of the first, which are of the twelve apostles of the Lamb, and shall make known the plain and precious things which have been taken away from them, and shall make known unto the, all kindreds, tongues, and people that the Lamb of God is the Son of the Eternal Father and the Savior of the world, and that all men must come unto Him or they cannot be saved. What does verse 39 and verse 40 sound a whole lot like? It sounds a lot like the title page, which was written 1,000 years after this vision took place, by a different person, not Nephi, but they're saying the same thing. And what is it? The bottom line, the Book of Mormon is what's going to prepare people for the second coming. And how they treat it, if they treat it lightly, they'll be under condemnation, like we found out in Doctrine and Covenants. If they treat it lightly, not only what condemnation brings them, but all the warnings that we've listed through uh, the different verses already uh, so far. Okay, now uh, one more verse, and then I'll go back to quoting President Nelson. 1 Nephi 14.14. 1 14. Nephi 14.14. 14. Okay, here's what Nephi sees in the last days. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God as it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb and upon the covenant people of the Lord who were scattered upon all the face of the earth. And they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. Man, thank goodness. So here we go. All these warnings, hey, there's going to be Latter-day Saints that do this, 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 and the other thing, and it's all bad stuff. And then Nephi says, hey, at the conclusion of this vision that he just saw, it's okay. Now, it's not all as well in Zion, but there's an opportunity for, for us to feel confident. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God that it descended upon the saints of the church and upon the covenant people of the Lord. What's interesting about the word covenant? How many times has President Nelson told us to get on and stay on the covenant path? President Nelson, speaking about this very verse, we live in that day that our forefathers have awaited with anxious expectation. 
we have front row seats to witness live what the prophet Nephi saw only in vision, that the power of the Lamb of God would descend upon the covenant people of the Lord who were scattered upon all the face of the earth. And they were armed with righteousness and with power of God in great glory. He said that in April Conference 2020. President Nelson, when I think of the Book of Mormon, I think of the word power. How many times did we just read power in the previous verse? The truths of the Book of Mormon have the power to heal, comfort, restore, succor, strengthen, console, and cheer our souls. Now, let's shift gears again. Let's go to a New Testament um, parable from the Savior, the Ten Virgins. Okay, the ten vir and the interesting thing about par uh, parables is they're not only parables, but they're prophecies. And so Wilford Woodruff said specifically of the parable of the ten virgins that not only was it a parable for us to learn from, but that it was a prophecy as well. So you, you know the story. We're not going to go through it. But he says it's a prophecy. In fact, he got so certain and direct on it that he said, so it will be with the Latter-day Saints that half will be ready to receive the Savior and half, five and five, the other half will not be prepared or nearly as prepared as they think they are. Because you remember the story, the ten virgins, they all went out to meet the bridegroom, right? And five of them were able to go into the wedding feast and five weren't. And why weren't the five? Because they didn't have enough oil. But these five, they weren't... Um, we call them evil sometimes, which isn't, isn't correct. In the scriptures, they, it, they're called unwise. Who are the five? They're, they're members of the church. They're doing things that they think are right. And they're fully expecting to be completely prepared when the Savior returns. And they're shocked. They're, they're taken back. What do you mean I'm not prepared? I, I thought, I, of course I'm ready, right? Doctrine and Covenants 45, 56 through 59, talking about this parable. The Lord says, and at that day, when I shall come in my glory, shall the parable be fulfilled, which I spake concerning the ten virgins. Right? Wilford, Elder Wil, Wilford Woodruff said it was a prophecy. So does the Savior. For they that are wise and have received the truth and have taken the Holy Spirit for their guide and have not been deceived, verily I say unto you, they shall not be hewn down and cast into the fire, but shall abide the day. And the earth shall be given unto them for an inheritance. And they shall multiply and wax strong, and their children shall grow up without sin unto salvation. For the Lord shall be in their midst, and his glory shall be upon them, and he will be their king and their lawgiver. Let me read to you 3 Nephi 15. So now we're talking about this parable in three books of Scripture, because now I'm going to take you to 3 Nephi. In 3 Nephi 15... Let's see here. Here it is. In 3 Nephi 14. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me at that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in the name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me. Unfortunately, when we fall into the trap of all is well in Zion and eat, drink, and be merry, we, it, we're, we've got a foot in both sides of the, in, in each game, and it, it just doesn't work. We've got to have both feet in, in the correct side and do the things that we're supposed to do, and if we do, then, uh, then, then we'll, be, we'll be ready. So, so it says. Joseph Smith says this, Christ says, now we're, we're coming off that parable and going, going again here on something different. Joseph Smith, Christ says, No man knoweth the day or the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Did Christ speak this as a general principle throughout all, throughout all generation? Oh, no. He spoke in the present tense. No man that was living then knew the day or the hour. But he did not say that there was no man throughout all generations that should not know the day or the hour. No, for this would be in flat contradiction with other scripture. For the prophet Amos says that God will do nothing but what he will reveal unto his servants, the prophets. 
Joseph Smith claims that the prophet knows when the Savior's coming. Let me just read to you the words of our living prophet. In April 2020, President Nelson, The time is coming when those who do not obey the Lord will be separated from those who do. In the same general conference, Meanwhile, here and now, we live in a time of turmoil. Earthquakes and tsunamis wreck devastation. Governments collapse. Economic stresses are severe. The family is under attack and divorce rates are rising. We have great cause for concern. But we do not need to let our fears displace our faith. We can combat those fears by strengthening our faith. In April 2019, the forces of evil have never raged more forcefully than they do today. As servants of the Lord, we cannot be asleep while this battle rages. The same warning that Nephi gave us. Why do we need such resilient faith? Because difficult days are ahead. Make your focus on daily repentance, so an integral to your life that you can exercise the priesthood with greater power than ever before. This is in a priesthood session. This is the only way you will keep yourself and your family spiritually safe in the challenging days ahead. April 2019. Now, as president of his church, I plead with you who have distanced yourself from the church and with you who have not yet really sought to know the Savior's church has been restored. Do the spiritual work to find out for yourselves, and please do it now. Time is running out. In the coming days, it, oh, excuse me, let's do this one first. I am optimistic about the future. It will be filled with opportunity. Isn't that nice? All those quotes I just gave you, and then he says, I am optimistic about the future. It will be filled with opportunities for each of us to progress, contribute, and take the gospel to every corner of the earth. But I am also not naive about the days ahead. We live in a world that is complex and increasingly contentious. The constant availability of social media and a 24-hour news cycle bombard us with relentless messages. If we are to have any hope of sifting through the, uh, uh, all the voices and the philosophies of men that attack truth, we must learn to receive revelation. And then another a separate quote. In the coming days, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, and comforting and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. I love his warnings, just like Nephi. Lots of warnings, but it's all backed up with love and compassion and hope. And hope that, hey, Heavenly Father's got this under control. He knows what's going on. And because he's so well on knowing what's going on and being in control... He has fed us, as Latter-day Saints, the playbook. And if we just follow the playbook, as best we can, not even perfectly, he doesn't even ask, but just the best we can, then we're okay. It's all right. We can listen to the warnings, but we don't need to fear the warnings. If you are prepared, you shall not fear. Doctrine and Covenant 6, 33 through 36. This doesn't have to do with the second coming, but it's a promise made, to, in this case, to Joseph and Oliver from the Lord, and because it's scripture, we can liken it to ourselves. And because it's, it's a truth spoken by the Savior, that means it's an eternal truth. So because of all that, verses 33 through 36 of Doctrine and Covenant 6 is applicable to us and applicable to the topic that we've been discussing. Fear not to do good, my sons. For whatsoever ye sow, that shall you also reap. Therefore, if you sow good, you shall also reap good for your reward. Therefore, fear not, little flock. Do good. Let earth and hell combine against you, for if you are built upon my rock, they cannot prevail. Behold, I do not condemn you. Go your ways and sin no more. Perform with soberness the work which I have commanded you. Look unto me in every thought. Doubt not. Fear not. Tonight I've talked a lot of, uh, about a lot of things. And a lot of them can make us quite uneasy and apprehensive for the future. But with all of that, we've got to remember what President Nelson said. Don't let uh, fear displace our faith. And remember that our Heavenly Father is in control. He's given us the perfect playbook. And we can say, like Joseph B. Worthland said in a general conference talk a few years ago, come what may and love it. Do you remember that talk? Come what may and love it.
as President Nelson said, look forward optimistically. Well, everything we've talked about tonight, it all connects back to the Book of Mormon. I don't think it's any wonder that our Come Follow Me topic is the Book of Mormon this year. Because when we look at the Book of Mormon, I can't think or identify any single source in all the world that contains all the signs of the second coming, but also a way to navigate through, through these uh, signs that we're, that we're faced with today while simultaneously bringing nothing but hope and confidence for the future. What a perfect thing. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to conclude with that, although there's much more that could be said. But I uh, hope that you'll go and find it on your own and, and connect these dots in your own way and in your own time. Uh, but I, I will say that the things that I've shared with you, uh, outside of my opinion, the quotes that I've read and the scriptures that I've read, I know to be true. And looking hindsight in the way that Heavenly Father has prepared us for today, tonight, this very moment, to be spiritually in tune with His Spirit, to have increased relationship with Him and our, and our Savior, only proves that Heavenly Father is going to see us all the way through this to the end. And if we do, but hold tight to that iron rod, listening to the prophet's voice and doing it our very best and nothing more than that, then things will turn out. And come what may, we're going to love it. I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.